And truly, we pray that God will give you the strength to do all that you have dreamt to do and also raise people just like the pillars you had there who will be pillars and uphold the dream that he has placed in your heart. Our next speaker is Dr. Modupe Adefeso Olateju. She is a distinguished policy expert with a focus on fostering public-private collaborations in the field of education. She is a fellow at the Brookings Institution Center for, for Universal Education, where her leadership extends to a global social impact network dedicated to the transformation of education systems. Mo is the visionary behind the Education Partnership TEP Center, a trailblazing education partnership organization in Nigeria. For several years, she led the Learn Nigeria program, a citizen-led initiative aimed at accessing and enhancing the foundational literacy and numeracy skills of Nigerian children. Additionally, she co-established the annual Pan-African Education Innovation Summit, NEDIS, which is now in its eighth year. Her expertise is sought after by policymakers, international think tanks, and corporations, leading her to spearhead various education sector support initiatives funded by government agencies, multilateral organizations, and corporate entities. Mo played a pivotal role as a member of the Policy Advisory Council, articulating education sector policy priorities for Nigeria's national government. She has contributed to several international development initiatives, including her role as commissioner for the Global Commission on Evidence to Address Societal Challenges at McMaster University, Canada. And Mo has provided valuable insights to organizations on initiatives such as the UNESCO GEM report, Education Cannot Wait, education amongst others. Dr. Mo holds a prestigious position of chair on the International Board of the Malala Fund and serves as a trustee of the Human Capital of Human Capital Africa and Slum to School Africa. She is the university. She earned her PhD in education and international development as a centenary scholar from the University of, of from the University College London's Institute of Education, where she also achieved a master's degree with distinction. She is recognized as a fellow of the Asia Global Institute in Hong Kong, further solidifying her standing as an influential figure in the field of education policy and transformation. Please join me as I welcome Dr. Mo to the platform. A warm round of applause, please. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon for those who are joining us online and maybe joining from other countries. Good evening to those who might be joining from other countries as well. It is a distinct pleasure for me to be here. And I want to say a special thank you to the visionaries behind the platform. What fascinates me the most about the platform is that we come here to explore national and continental development. But then we also find opportunities to plug ourselves into those visions and identify what we can do as individuals. And so I celebrate you, Pastor Oju, and I celebrate you, the beautiful Pastor Tony Romero. Thank you so much. So my presentation um, is going to focus on education because that's what I do, education. And I know that uh, the situation on our continent uh, gives us a lot of concern, is a source of concern for many people. But I want to challenge us today to do something a little different. And it is within the realm of dreaming. I really want us to begin to dream differently about education and knowledge, not just for Nigeria, but also for the continent of Africa. And so, I will be speaking on why it is that Nigeria needs a new dream for its education system. But you see, the thing is, I was a teacher. And if you know anything about teachers, we find it very difficult to stand still. And so I will be inviting you on a journey, and we're going to be walking together down many years, and also walking forward as well. 
many years. So please indulge me and come with me because our journey is going to start 54 years ago in 1969. How many people were here in 1969? How many people remember being here in 1969? Those are the people that we need to turn to, kneel down, <laughs> and salute, because those are our elders. A few interesting things were happening in Nigeria in 1969. A few, different, a few things were happening globally in 1969. And one of those things is, and I'm going to ask somebody to please um, assist me with this clicker so that I can you know, sort of get on with the presentation. Yes, that's it, thank you. One of the things that was happening in 1969 was that we had three different dimensions. And those dimensions pertain to communications, pertain to entertainment, and also pertain to commerce. So please, can I have the next slide? Those of you who remember being here in 1969 might remember that the picture on the left is how we used to communicate. So very analog. We didn't have mobile phones, obviously. The one in the middle, the very handsome man that you can see in the middle, was one of the biggest entertainment stars. He was a sporting legend called Pele, and he died recently. And the picture on the right uh, is a picture of currencies that depicts commerce. And why is this important? Commerce in those days was really about paper and about coins. And another interesting fact, is that the currency that we spent in Nigeria then was called the Nigerian pound. And the Nigerian pound exchanged one for one British pound. And so if you had one British pound, you would get one Nigerian pound. Very interesting. The other thing that I must say before I move on is that it was also a time of crisis because Nigeria at the time was coming to the end of a civil war that had devastated the country. There is an estimated, up to three million people are estimated to have lost their lives in the Nigerian civil war. And so it was also a time of reflection for the country. And it was a time that people were asking themselves the question, how do we ensure that we never get back to the place where we have to be at war with ourselves as a society. And so 1969 represented a time of crisis. It represented a time when people did not have the opportunity to love each other as we, as they should, really have been able to. It also represented a time when patriotism was at an all-time low. But I'll shift to education because that's what I do. And there's a quote on the screen from Nelson Mandela that talks about how it is that education is the most powerful weapon with which we can use to change the world. Oh yes, Nigeria was infamous for weapons in 1969. We used a lot of weapons that perhaps we shouldn't have used on ourselves. And we devastated our own country. Next slide. And so, in 1969, a group of people came together and they said, you know what? We're going to have to fix this. We're going to have to dream a new dream for this country called Nigeria, which has only achieved its independence from the British government for nine years. If we're going to stay together and ensure that we do not fragment anymore, education is going to be the lever. And the truth is there is no society in the world that has ever developed without addressing its education system. Education continues to be the bedrock for any kind of growth or development in a nation. And so these people sat together. And who were they? They weren't just the professors. They were professors, quite all right. They were teachers. They were welders. They were nurses, doctors, students. Almost the entirety of society came together and said, we want a new dream. We want a new vision. We want a new philosophy. We want a new thinking about our nation. 
What does it actually mean to be a Nigerian? And how do we exercise our Nigerianness? But most importantly, how do we birth a generation of people that will remain Nigerians with the values that Nigerians are supposed to have? And so we carry on. There are a few enduring legacies from the 1969 Curriculum Conference. Some of us might know that the foundation of what we refer to as the 6334 education system was actually birthed in 1969. It wasn't operationalized until two decades later. But at that conference, it was determined that our children must have six years of primary education. And at the end of three years of secondary education, we must create three pathways for our young people. They must be able to either continue on to senior secondary, or they must be able to have something that enables them to be productive when it comes to technical and vocational education, or they must be able to go into teacher training college. And so the foundations were born in 1969. And then some of us here may have gone to Unity Colleges. Anybody here from a federal government college? I hail you all. The foundations of that was also laid in 1969. How many youth, youth corps uh, alumni, or maybe present serving youth corps are in the room? Anyone carried out the National Youth Service? I hope people in this room carried out the National Youth Service. <laughs> OK, very good. So the foundations of that was laid there as well, because there's no better way to harmonize and unite a country than to make sure that they intermarry, right, across ethnic lines, make it very difficult for them to fragment. So that was very strategic, and that was what that conference achieved. Now, the thing is that we might argue, some people argue, and they say, well, what's the point of the 6334 system? What's the point of the Unity Schools? They're not well run. You know, we don't achieve the quality standards that we're looking for. What's the purpose of NYSE? We are endangering lives as we send young people across the country. That's not the point. The point is that those policies were developed 54 years ago because some people dared to dream and we are living their dream today. That is the power of a dream. I'm gonna carry on to the next slide and bring us back into the current day because, hey, it's 2023. And what is happening in 2023? Let's move on. Again, along the themes of communication, well, we don't use analog phones anymore. I don't think anybody queues to make a phone call anymore. Some people might even have the iPhone 15, which I hear is the latest mobile telephony. Not me, but some people. Um, so I think we've advanced over the last 54 years. People like Ronaldo have replaced Pele, and I sincerely apologize to Messi fans, <laughs> because... Uh... I, I have to be fair and equitable, so please accept my apologies, but he is probably one of the biggest and most marketable uh, entertainment stars in the world today. And um, some people still use the, you know, the paper and the coins, but not very many. I mean, most people do the transactions via cards, you know, and also via digital payments. So things have changed, they've evolved, but unfortunately, some things haven't actually changed. We still have conflict across this country, across this continent, violent conflict for that matter, that leads to displacement of lives, and people have been living in internally displaced people, people's camps for years. Our patriotism, we can argue about whether we're truly patriotic as a people, and whether we feel that our countries have given us an opportunity to stay patriotic. So some things have changed, but some things have remained the same. And so we'll carry on. The statistics, I'm gonna share a few. Not exactly cherry either. Nigeria is signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 of them, and we have promised that we're going to do our very best to ensure that we achieve these goals by the year 2030, but how are we faring out of 166 countries that have signed up to the goals? Nigeria is currently ranked 146, and of the 17 development goals, we're only on track to achieve one and there's some questions about how we're even measuring that particular goal. So, not a great picture. We carry on. What's interesting is that the Financial Times, and they put out this beautiful graphic a few years ago, 
Arguing that for us to achieve the sustainable development goals that I just referred to, education is going to have to be central. And the sustainable development goal on education, which actually focuses on quality education, is that which is going to create the multiplier effect that's going to help us achieve all the other 16 goals. So whether it's the goal, whether they're the goals on health, whether they're the goals on climate, environment, etc., without quality education, we will struggle to achieve and to sustain those goals. So education is important. And as we carry on, the interesting thing is that at the heart of the SDG4, which itself is the bedrock of the entirety of the SDGs, is foundational literacy and numeracy. What are you going to do if you can't even read? You're not numerate. You can't build anything. You can't do anything. And what does the data tell us? Seven out of 10 Nigerian children is unable to read by the time they're 10. To give you perspective, a Nigerian child should be able to read a simple text by the time they're eight years old. Seven out of 10 cannot do this by the time they're 10 years old. It's not a great picture. Carry on. I'm gonna give you some more statistics. You can think of them either as positive or negative. But population is another big one because we talk a lot about Nigeria's population and every country like Nigeria that is big and growing wants to reap the dividends of its democracy or dividends of its demography, rather. But what do our figures look like? 41%. So 41% of children aged 0 to 14, 41% uh, of our population is aged 0 to 14. So almost 50% of our population is younger than 15 years old. Sounds wonderful, isn't it? We're a young population. Wow, the future is bright. But then go back to the previous slide. Seven out of 10 of them cannot read by the time they're 10. Is that an asset or is that going to be a liability? Nigeria is the third, um, what is projected, to be the third most populous country in the world by 2050, ranking after only India and China. Again, sounds like a great thing, doesn't it? And then they're not educated. 68% of the global workforce growth is gonna come from Sub-Saharan Africa. And Nigeria represents one fifth of Sub-Saharan Africa. How are they gonna power anything if they don't have skills? And then, for me, one of the saddest statistics is really around poverty, because one out of eight of the most extremely poor people in the world lives in this country. These are not great numbers. We can move on. It's not all doom and gloom across the entire continent. If we look at the statistics as it pertains to sustainable development goals, and we look at the current index in the year 2023, we find out that Four out of the five highest scoring or highest ranking countries are actually in North Africa. So Africa is not doing terribly. We have five countries that are doing pretty okay. But four of them come from North Africa. And you can see there, Tunisia, you can see um, uh, Morocco, you can see Algeria, and you can also see um, Egypt. Only Cape Verde is currently bucking the trend. Now, what is interesting is, remember, Nigeria accounts for one-fifth of Sub-Saharan Africa. So if Sub-Saharan Africa is going to match up with North Africa, Nigeria is going to need to rise. And if Nigeria is able to rise, the entire region is able to rise. And that is the urgency around why we need transformative societies. Now, the Brookings Institution has done some fabulous work to help countries and nation states to begin to think about these sorts of dire statistics and ask themselves, how do we project into the future? How do we fix the system? How do we transform our education system? Because we can't run, we actually can't run away from it. And the thing is that there is an urgency around systems transformation. If you know anything about how education works in a country like Nigeria, the one thing that hits you smack in the face is that it is siloed. Departments are not talking to each other. Units are not talking to each other. People are sat in the same offices and they're not speaking to each other. 
policies are created in one room, legislation in another, the executive sits in another room, right? The legislature sits in another room. And the teachers are in a completely different space outside of that circle. And the teachers are supposed to be the implementers. So we're going to need a system that is more cohesive, a system that talks to itself better. And that is the heart of education systems transformation. And a beautiful piece of work, again, done by Brookings, a paper written by Winthrop and Senge, argues that for you to begin to think about systems transformation within your jurisdiction, you need to think about three things. You need to think about, first of all, what is the purpose of education anyway? Why are we even doing this? Why are we educating people? The second question we have to ask ourselves is what is happening in the classroom? A lot of things are happening outside of the classroom. A lot of policies, legislation, is being enacted outside of the classrooms. If I turn to my left and I look at these children who come, obviously, from a secondary school, and we ask them the extent to which they're engaged in policy, they might give me a blank stare, because that's what our system does. We don't include the most important people in the conversation, and they represent the most important people. Please, a round of applause for them right there. So purpose, pedagogy, which is simply the science of teaching and learning. But the third dimension is positioning. How do we bring all the actors together? How do we bring all the elements together? How do we ensure that as we're rethinking education, in the room we have the teachers, we have the learners, we have the business people, we have the policy makers, we do have the politicians, we have the manufacturers, we have everyone participating in that, in that central objective of redefining education and making sure that that translates into what happens in the teaching space. And so we carry on. At TEP Center, we started to think about this about eight years ago. We'd worked very closely with government, and um, we had recognized that this was an issue, the fact that the system wasn't talking to each other. And we said, if the society was going to begin to fix itself, certain things needed to happen. And one of the most important aspects of what needs to happen is this refreshed vision. But you see, it's not, we're not starting from the vision for education. We're starting from the vision for the nation. What is Nigeria? What is the Nigerian dream? Who is the Nigerian? A lot of people in diaspora have a sense of unity because in the otherness, of being in diaspora, they find their identity as Nigerians. But when we come back home, who is the Nigerian? Not who is the Yoruba man, the Igbo man, the Hausa man, the Fulani man. Not who is the Christian woman, the Muslim man. Who is the Nigerian? So we start from there. And then, after we do that, we can begin to ask ourselves, what is the vision for the educated Nigeria. So by the time we bequeath you with nine years of schooling, what do we expect to see? By the time we give you 12 years of schooling, what are our outcomes? By the time you get 16 years of schooling, or like some of us, 20 plus years of schooling, what should we expect to see from you? What is that vision? And thirdly, is the curriculum pathway. And by curriculum at TEP Center, we don't mean Math, English, physics, those are curricular subjects. For us, curriculum is a roadmap. It's a roadmap that takes you from where you are as a country or as a jurisdiction to where you want to be by investing in your people. That is what curriculum is. And so we say around this, we need to ask 10 very, very important questions. The first question is, what are we going to teach? What knowledge do we want these people to have? What skills, what competencies, and very importantly, what values do we want them to have? The second question there is, who is going to design this system? Is it going to be the people who have traditionally designed the education system? Or do we need to think about being more inclusive? Do we need to have those who are, for example, in industry, in research, participate in designing our curriculum? We also have another question there. Let's move on to the third question. Um, who, let me point to it here, whom should we include, right? So who should we include in that process? 
And for me, this is a very important point because inclusiveness is not about being tokenistic. It's not about saying we need the representation of somebody who is differently abled in the room. It's about saying that a person who is differently abled has significant value to add to the conversation. And if we don't have them in the room, we are losing out on the benefit of what they bring to the table. Same thing with gender. Same thing with people who are poor. Everyone has value to add, but are we being deliberate about including them in the process? The next point there is, who is going to deliver this curriculum? And of course, the answer would be teachers, right? But in 2023, who is a teacher? I remember spending one and a half years during the pandemic homeschooling my children because it was very challenging to go to school at that time. And I am an educator, but still, I remember the joy and the gladness with which I handed them back over to their teachers and their schools after the pandemic was over. Who is a teacher? In today's world, Sometimes the teacher is not even a human being. Sometimes the teacher is technology. Sometimes it's artificial in, in intelligence. Sometimes the teacher is the child himself or the child herself. So the question is, who's going to deliver that curriculum? So we need to rethink that. Then, when should we teach? What do we need to teach in early years versus what we need to teach when children have received nine years of education already? I have a mobile phone in my hands. And the question I'm asking myself is, why do we need to wait for a person to be in the university or in a technical institution before they can uncouple this phone and try to put it back together? Can't we do that slightly earlier, given the kind of global economy that we're looking at and the world that we live in? So that's a very important question. The next question that we ask is, how are we going to deliver this curriculum exactly? So it's nice to be in a physical classroom teaching, but come on, the world has moved beyond that. Many learners, particularly older learners, don't have the time, the resources, or the ability to be in a physical classroom. Is our education system recognizing that? Are we recognizing that enough? Are we spending enough time thinking about the role of alternative pathways and technology, thinking about new ways of producing teaching and learning materials that are relevant to our learners. Then we ask the next question, which is, so this new curricular arrangement, eh, how is it gonna be managed? So we have to then decouple our public administration systems. And then we have to start asking uncomfortable questions about the role of the private sector. Is there a role for public-private partnership as we think about the management of our education system? As we prepare for the next X number of years, is there a role for the government to fund and the private sector to manage? New ways of thinking, I think, have become quite important for us. And then we ask another question, how are we going to assess this curriculum? Is it going to be the same way that we carry out our learning assessments? We assess math and English and tests. Or are there other ways that we need to be assessing based on this curriculum? Are there other skills that we need to be assessing? The ability to cooperate with each other the ability to collaborate, how we communicate, the extent to which children are able to decipher what is true information and what is disinformation. Do we need to be able to assess that in the world that we're living in and the one that we're going into? And then we have the next point there, which is who is going to pay for all of this? Now before the, the assessment and then the payment, because again, as we think about you know, these curricular arrangements and a new way of thinking, somebody's going to have to pay for it. There are different ways of resourcing it. What sort of funding can be catalytic? What sort of funding needs to come from the government? What sort of funding does not need to come from the government? And how do we rethink all of this? And then a very, very important question at the end. Where are they going to work? So we're educating a new group of people. But if we're not clear on the alternative pathways that are going to get them into employment, if we're not clear on how it is that we're going to ensure that they become productive members of society, then we would have failed in our responsibility. So these are the 10 questions that we ask ourselves in our organization. A few months ago, I'm rounding off in a, in a short while. A few months ago, 
five people were given a responsibility to establish education sector priorities for the incoming administration. And I was one of the five people. And so we sat and we began to think about what those priorities could be, but then we recognized that the truth was five people can't do this. So we began to consult. And we started to have consultations with different stakeholder groups. We talked to people in agriculture, people in the financial services sector, people in the health sector. We talked to teachers, we talked to you know, educators, we talked to a broad you know, grouping of people. And we came up with five ideas. If we're going to move education forward, if we're going to refresh our vision, five ideas are important. And what are those five ideas? One, there is need for us to refresh our national vision and our education philosophy. Because it was wonderful what happened in 1969. But we live in a slightly different world. Some might argue in a very different world. Secondly, the philosophy and not the politics should actually drive policy and curriculum. So where it is that we want to go as a people is what should drive how it is that we teach or train our people. Third, now this is a very controversial one, education is a potential driver of economic growth. Education is not a sinkhole. Education is not merely uh, a social investment or an expense category. Education can drive growth. When we think about the number of teachers that are employed in the sector, and how they're, they're, they're contributing to the growth of our economy. When we think about the industries that are built around schools, you go to any public school today, there's a little industry around that school of people selling pencils, erasers, fruit, ice cream, little economies around the thousands of schools that we have. Yet, we continue to treat education as if it is some sort of sinkhole. We can't move forward that way. The fourth is really about accountability. And it's in incredibly important that accountability is embedded in all our institutional arrangements, at the ministry, in the ministries of education, in the departments, in the agencies of education. And finally, education needs to be functionally separated from politics and political cycles. Why is this important? The average political cycle is four years or eight years. The maximum you're gonna get is eight years. But for you to reap the benefits of the education system, the minimum amount of time that you need to wait is nine years. Because basic education in Nigeria is nine years of schooling. And so, if you want to become a productive economy, you don't stop at nine years. You move forward. You give them senior secondary education. You offer them tertiary education. You offer them the opportunity to build skills and capacity. And that is what moves our country forward. And so we started to dream a new dream as the Policy Advisory Council. And some of the key words in that dream, a dynamic, innovative, learning ecosystem, a, a future-ready workforce, so one that is ready to address the challenges of the future, one that has access to quality education. These are some of the key words that framed the way that we began to dream. But you see, the thing is that we can't dream alone. It's not sufficient for us to dream alone as a group of five people and as a collective of those whom we consulted with. And so I'm going to move us now into what I believe is the future. And so we started out from 1969. We're in the current day. But in 54 years' time, it's going to be 2077. How many people are going to be here in 2077? How many? Raise it high, raise it high. I say, amen. <laughs> you know the interesting thing? Advances in science and technology can make it possible for us to live much longer than we thought we could live. So we might all very well be here in the year 2077. Right? <laughs> what, 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 what is communications going to look like? I don't know. I can't really answer that question. But we might have virtual reality platforms through which we're communicating. What about entertainment? Maybe robots will be playing football then and entertaining us all. 
And what about commerce? Maybe I'll be purchasing things using my iris in 2077, my eyeball. I don't know. But what's the point? The point is that if we're going to move another 54 years and actually see a country like Nigeria play its role in lifting Africa, then we're going to have to dream a new dream. And we're going to have to dream that dream from now. And as I reflect on the quote on the screen from a lady called Margaret Mead, I realize that it's only people who are committed, and we don't have to be many, people that look like the people that I can see in this room and the people that are watching online. It's only that group of committed citizens that can make that change happen. Because we are the ones who can dream that dream. As people did, I mean 2077, so 108 years ago, right? We're gonna have to start doing that from today. And so my charge to you is who wants to put their hand up to begin to mobilize people, to ask the question, what do we want our society to look like? What should we be educating for? Whom should we be educating for? What sort of systems should we be looking for? I don't know who's ready to dream a new dream, but I am. And I pray that you are as well. Thank you very much.